got my master's degree in 1946. And uh, at that point, I had done my master's thesis on the business cycle. That was the subject. And I was comparing the work of neoclassicists with the work of institutionalists. And at that time, the, the whole that's what you learned when you learned when you were t doing graduate work uh, on the on the on the business cycle and how the neoclassicists developed models uh, that were based on underlying theories of uh, of economics about what was going to ha happen uh, but they were frequently somewhat distantly related from the point of view of forecasting to what actually happened uh because they were based on the theory but they were testing it very lightly and then you had the group of people, economists who were called institutionalists uh, and they rejected much of the theories and they were into being very accurate descriptions of what was happening uh, this is when i came in there but um they they had a very no no great ability to of models for the basis of prediction uh, and so on. So uh, my whole thesis was on comparing the, the work of the institutionalists with the work of the neoclassicists. And at the time, uh, I, I uh, said it needed both. And there had to be a compromise uh, between um what shall i say simplicity and accuracy uh, and that was the thesis what the, the the thesis was about and remember that was at a time when uh, john maynard Keynes added a few uh, many new items to, to the whole whole thing anyway so I, I don't remember exactly how i got the job at uh mber but somebody uh who was at, at Chicago recommended me to them. And I, as I say, I don't know it. And I got a call from them and asking. And that was when they had an office in New York on, on Columbus Square and Circle uh, and so on. And, uh, and then I was so absorbed with the business cycle that that was great. Uh, and so that's where I went, went uh, every day for, uh, until I worked there really about a year and a quarter uh, and so on. Uh, so it was really uh, 1946 uh, to uh, 1947. So I, I was I was very young. I, I, I graduated college before I was 20. So <laughs> this was all <laughs> very much of my, my uh, youth. And um, when I started there, I was put on collecting data, okay? And, you know, mat meticulous collect. That's, and I had always, um, uh, uh, maybe just back up a second. Uh, how did I get to be an economist? There weren't many women <laughs> at the time. Uh, I, I went to Hunter College and they, I, gave, I got the best college education it was possible to get. But along the way, first of all, I never thought I'd have a career in my future. Uh, you know, that didn't have, that wasn't it, it. But I, but you had to take two years of liberal arts education and, you know, and, and, to, and along the way in social science, I took an economics course and in, um, uh, and in uh, math, you could had to take two years of mathematics. Uh, and I took a statistics course at the same time. And then I kept wondering, why are we so stressing in economics theory and not verifying it if we have these statistical techniques? You know, that, that, that puzzled me. There wasn't enough. And, and I had an honors course there, but we 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 talked about the theories or we talked about the data but we there wasn't the connection and and so you can see why the nbr was the right kind of place to begin and i i had even then you know a great respect for, for them and thought there was a lot of learning to to be done so i was put on collecting data 
that's the, the, you know, the, and uh, so when they were developing new series, you know, they didn't just use the consumer price index. It was a lot of components of the consumer price index. I would go to the major public, the, the, the main great library in New York on 42nd, on 42nd Street. Street. Yeah, right. And I would uh, ask for 20 years of the monthly labor review. And they would bring a cart uh, uh, in it, and then I would be copying. And again, the the uh, the uh, whole emphasis in the MBR was accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. You you know, and so I would always go back and check every number I put down. And by the way, you didn't do it on a computer; you did it with a pen and a pen, a piece of paper. I was uh, puzzled by uh, they were doing quarterly uh, data. Uh, the, a lot of the analysis was by the MBR was being done quarter, on quarterly data. And, and they were now going back when I was there. I remember, as, as I said, all the components of the consumer price index and the industrial and, you know, components. I was working on components of the big in, in, in the, And I raised the question, with, I didn't dare raise these questions with Wesley Claire Mitchell, by the way, I was much too much in awe of that, but whoever was my boss, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, uh, I said, why don't we collect monthly data? And, uh, and, and th because then you, you'd see it much more. And then, uh, so there were two things I worked on. And, and, and I said, then and then I mean, I began to collect monthly data. Then they went along with that idea, at least to try it for a while. Uh, so that was that's why I was going back to collect every index on a new basis, you know, of their major th things. And uh, then I realized that every once in a while there was a spike. And so anytime there was a spike. I then dug into other literature to find out why the spike happened and whether that should be taken. And, and then the next problem I came into was uh, that, um, it, it, let's say uh, some component of the consumer price index. Uh, and then they would change slightly the structure of the index. You, you know, the structure would be changed. And, I said, uh, and then they they just moved on to it. I said, well, we ought because they over always had an overlap of uh, four or five months or six months or something like that. Right. I said, why don't we do a regression of the overlap in order to make it a continuum? And and they did do that, uh, uh, and so on. Yeah, that so was that very part bold. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that that. A continuum, uh, 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 and 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 then they, you know, we did did the regressions and 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 so on. So that's really what I remember of of the whole a uh, whole thing. In a sense, I, well, I that's why I'm telling. You, I didn't mean to be talking so much. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the the way I came into the field stayed with me at the NBER. You know, the connection between the business cycle and the data you use to, to verify it, though I was not involved in the verification uh, uh, of it. But those were my contributions. So, so, Anita, let me let me jump in and ask two things. So first, at Chicago, who was your thesis supervisor for the master's thesis? Jacob Marshak. OK, so uh -huh. so Jacob had connections at some point that probably went back to New York uh, in various ways. But isn't this, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, this is the period when the institutionalists in some sense were personified by Wesley Clare Mitchell and exactly. Arthur Burns at that point. And this is the moment of the Koopmans, Coles Foundation versus NBER measurement without theory debate. So you were in some sense standing with a foot in each camp on this yeah. Koopmans versus the, the Burns and Mitchell on business cycles kind of discussion. Yeah, yeah. And I was, uh, well, subsequently, I started my PhD. Uh, I, I finished all, all the exams, but I never wrote a dissertation once I got married. But Arthur Burns was one of my professors at Columbia. 
I, I, so so I took all the courses and, and, courses and I took my exams, but I never finished a dissertation. I got married. I was in New Haven. That was yep. the end of the story. <laughs> I but, thought but you, you started at Columbia in 1947, Anita. Yeah, at 47 or no, I think I started at uh, 48, uh, and then I got married in 1953. No, it was uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I I started the uh, the graduate the doctoral work in 48, uh, uh, and so on, and uh, but took courses more slowly because I was also working uh, and so on. Uh, and my uh, at Standard Oil, they let me go up for classes and, and, and things like that. So anyway, but I, as I said, I never once I got married, that was it. <laughs> and, and with your career arc, Anita, from the NBER, you moved on to Standard Oil. And that was that was a, a, a job change from one to the other at that point. Yeah, that's that was a, a total job change. Yes, a hundred percent total job change. That's the person you heard on the podcast who said when he offered the job, we decided we could get the same brains for less money. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> nowadays, you would one would have reacted rather differently than I did. <laughs> So I have a different question, and, and Claudia will then jump in, I bet, and add more. I, the, the composition, you were a master's student at Chicago, you were then a PhD student at Columbia, you were also a researcher, research assistant at the NBER. What was the fraction of women in the population's Chicago master's program, Columbia PhD program, and also at the NBER? At the NBER, uh, I... I was the only woman in, in the category I was in, which was uh, in, in that there were other couple young men and, and, and so on. I was in. And then when I went to uh, Chicago, uh, I can't answer how many graduate students they had in economics, with it, but there were six women uh, in it. And Jacob Viner was the, the person you had to take a course with uh, in, in uh, economic theory for your first year, you know, micro and macro. And he was the most vicious person in the world on um, to women. He, he would come into the class and go to the board and write a whole set of equations on the board and then point to you and say, you, not your name, you go to the board and explain it. That's the way he would talk. And he would, there was, uh, there was one other woman in the class and she would cry each time uh, by the time he was through with them. No, it wasn't funny. It was, it was, I was terrified no, the entire wasn't. time. I mean, amazingly that there were six when I was in graduate school, there were three. Yeah, Marianne <laughs> Ferber uh, and, um, and uh, Lori oh, Klein. Marianne was there. Isn't and Lori Klein's wife was there. I see. Very interesting. Um, and we became lifelong friends. <laughs> so uh, uh, my mother also graduated from Hunter College. She also oh. went to Hunter High School and she was a stat major uh, at, at Hunter. What was your major at Hunter? My major was economics. But okay. I, I cho chose it. I, I had the uh, I, as I said, when I took the economics course and the statistics course at the same time, I became fascinated. And Kenneth, you might think I was influenced by Kenneth, uh, uh, but he was more a mathematician than an economist at that point, you, you know, and I knew I wasn't going to be a mathematician. Uh, that, I didn't have that skill uh, uh, for that. But uh, that's uh, ec the economics captured me and I got yeah. a, a very I think my mother minored in economics although to be frank she knew no economics as far as I can tell <laughs> I toyed with um uh with law and I had a what an outstanding teacher teaching uh, this is at Hunter constitutional law and I loved it I just loved it and uh and I had just see, uh, seen the, the Shakespearean play, what, what, what is it, um, Merchant of Venice, you know, where there's a female lawyer. 
and I thought, so I went to see this teacher, Stafford uh, was her name. And I said, I was thinking uh, possibly this was at the end of my sophomore year when you're choosing your major. I was thinking of maybe going to law school, a, a law. Is that is that something I could do? You know, and she said, you'll get in a good law school and you'll do fine. And from then on, you'll be in the back room with a law firm. You'll never see a courtroom. You'll never see an, a, a, a client. And that, was the, uh, I, and that was the end of that for me. <laughs> so that's a, what, a possible path I might have gone on. <laughs> so you clearly spent a lot of time in the 42nd Street Library copying these numbers. Unbelievable. The um, they knew me. As soon as they came in, out came the cart and, <laughs> and, and they asked <laughs> because I would spend hours and hours and hours there and you know, many days a week. And then, then I'd go back and work on these regressions and so on, you know, and, and, and so on. But, uh, so you but were, you were it, it, it followed sequentially, if you think about it. You know, the, the, the master thesis was on the business cycle. It took it took me into there uh, and it. it it followed a path, you know, and when I got to Standard Oil, uh, they didn't do most of the analyses with data, uh, with, you know, the idea of getting a historical data and then figuring out what to do. You know, I introduced that whole thing when there was a, a particular problem. I didn't do it with petroleum prices. I was on the state of the country, uh -huh. by the way. Not, I had nothing to do with oil. Right. And there, so, there was a lot of this. So when you would, uh, so I take it that you were filling these numbers into one of these big green spreadsheets that yeah. existed um, with a with a nice number two pencil with an eraser on it. Yeah, and, oh, I and forgot your, that. <laughs> beautiful handwriting that people at Hunter College insisted that you have a perfect handwriting. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then you would go back to Columbus Circle. Do you recall right. the people you saw there? Do you remember? Uh, I, don't, I really don't. I don't remember. I, I remember being in an office and I remember when Wesley Claire Mitchell came in, I was like scared to death that I was going to not say something right or do something wrong and so on. But he was always very courteous, but yes. very, very constructive uh, and and so on and would put me through, uh, you know, a, a grilling, but in a very nice way, uh, uh, you know, not not in a very appropriate way. I, I learned a lot of the discipline of working with numbers. That's the only way I know how to describe it at NBER because uh, and and it tied in so much with my work uh, on the dissertation and and then was there any connection anita from having encountered people like mitchell and burns at the nber and then the jump into graduate school at columbia because i in this era it always seems like there's a very close interplay between the columbia economics department and the nber at this time yeah, I, I well, the Columbia was because that was, Kenneth went there for his PhD, and it was down the block, so to speak. It was accessible to my home, and and all of that. So, and that was the place to go to in New York City. So there was no question, and and it, it, I could travel back and forth easily, and 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 all of that. I uh, I, I think I gave a brief thought uh, to NYU, but. Columbia seemed like the right place, particularly because of Burns. I, I yeah, I, I confess I was thinking more not of whether you thought Columbia was the place for you, but whether Columbia thought you were the place for that, that they were the place for you, and whether having had the time yeah, at the well, NBER there, facilitated getting in. There was no problem. I don't, I don't remember any problem in getting in. I, I had a good, decent record at, at Hunter, you know, uh, and so on. And they put me through the tests and so on. I don't did, remember the details, but it was not a problem. Do you remember if they required that you um, give sections to undergraduate classes or this was separate? That I did what? With that, that to, today, uh, our graduate students 
also teach undergraduates. That's how they support themselves in some sense. Oh, yeah. No, I, I didn't have, I didn't have any it. trouble supporting it because I had my income from NBER and my parents were, you know, that, that wasn't an issue. And, and then you I, I don't with remember Dora, I about, about the costs. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was, I, I don't remember any concern with that. I didn't have a fellowship. I had a fellowship, by the way, at the University of Chicago. Uh, to my amazement, when I applied there, they gave me a fellowship. I didn't. I don't re remember whether I asked for it or, or not. But it, it was. I, I was amazed at the time that I got it, and uh, I could have gone there without it. Is what I'm saying. On the, the only two people I remember are Mitchell and and Burns and so on. Well, and, probably they were your direct supervisors on this. Yeah, I, I, that's right. And I remember them coming in and talking about these issues and 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 so on. And uh, they, they did feel that I was being very accurate. I was obsessively accurate. I, I, I was I thought so, but I mean they were they, they liked that. They had they felt that. I know that. So let, let's go back to these big. So you you come back from the library with with this very very carefully <laughs> done list of price indexes monthly. Someone has to then take those and put them into a use a calculator to figure out you know this regression that you wanted to yes, run. Yes, no, that's what I would do. Yeah. And and you would sit there and and do the, the regression and invert yeah. the matrix. No. Yeah, no, I would do that. It, it, uh, I don't remember whether someone checked it, the whole thing and but I'm so on, but they were I I remember it's a, it was a lifetime kind of training in meticulousness. And, you know, uh, I already was that kind of person, uh, but uh, it verified that there were people in this world who did this. You know, I don't know. It was, I, I just remember feeling I learned about discipline in, in the work. It, uh, I got it very much stamped on me by my experience at NBER. And it's maintained to this day, <laughs> and is why you have the reputation you do. What, one thing, Anita, that's very interesting about this is, I mean, I, I have read in biographical work about Mitchell very much the spirit of what you've described, this painstaking attention to making sure it was recorded correctly, the, the focus on the data quality. I, I'd also heard that, the, that at various points, the NBER had a, a sort of two researchers or two research assistants worked on everything and then they tried to see whether the two gave concordant <laughs> answers to questions. It sounds like you were actually exempt from the, the two researcher because you had passed this criteria of Anita's so careful we could let her go out by herself to the to the public library. But the I, you know, hearing a little bit of, about and it, it's interesting that that sort of your you know that, that, that sort of the, there wasn't sort of a team sense of of collecting these data at the time, uh, which which I might have have expected. Uh, but clearly was not the case in in your setup. I'm, I'm curious also when you when you finished at Chicago, when you finished your master's, um, what you know yeah. it sounds like someone working on the business cycle as you were would have been attracted to the NBER as a as a place to work. And since you were from New York, it was also conveniently located in New York. But exactly. what were the do, do you have any recollection of what sort of the other options you might have considered were when you no, were finishing it, it your master's? came out it came out almost before I was through with my degree and and so on and so I I didn't look at anything else interesting uh, and it, it's the glove fit I remember just feeling oh business cycle business cycle uh, it, it, you know I had just spent so much time. Uh, on that and and so it was it was uh just right that's that's all i don't i didn't i don't remember any other thing that came up and then the uh, the standard oil thing came up because someone there um uh, knew me and suggested to them you know that they have me as an economist and uh, in, in, in the general economics and was that a connection somehow of someone who also knew the nber or was it someone who 
was in a different sphere, might have been someone from Chicago no, no, or someone, someone who knew It was an economist who was there, who I had met somewhere and, and so on, and he gave them my name and, and, and so on. And that's how it, uh, it happened. And I remember it came out of the blue. It never occurred to me I would work for Standard Oil in New Jersey. You know, that hadn't occurred to me at all. Uh, uh, remember, I didn't think in terms of big career. You have to put that whole framework it's a different framework and, and so on. And then when I heard this and uh, my father actually was uh, a little concerned, he said they have a reputation of anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, he was worried. And I said, it's not going to be a problem. It's not. And it never was, by the way. <laughs> the feminine being a woman was a problem, but uh, religion and stuff like that was not. So I, I have woman was. two, two follow-ons to this. One, I'm just trying to put the calendaring together of you and Kenneth. So is it a, it, it sounds like you might have come to the field of economics before Kenneth did. <laughs> no, did Kenneth you? was already, you know, through Harold Hotelling, uh, Kenneth had taken a course with Hotelling, uh, which was very mathematical yep. and, and so on. And that brought him into economics. But I didn't, I don't remember ever talking about economics to him, you know, uh, at that point. Uh, you, were the economics. You, you were majoring in economics by the end of your, by the start of your junior year at Hunter, which was the fall yeah, of. That's, that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. And fall he, of 1930, he, was, he was a mathematician then, 100% mathematician then, yeah. uh, not an economist. Right. Uh, so the, the first economist so, in the Arrow family was well, actually you. Not him. Well, he began to dip into it by then with hoteling at Got the it. same time, but uh, it wasn't uh, 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 this. Uh, okay. and, and I think that while we, we were very you, close all through the years, and my brother and I, uh, and so on. While while we have you on 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 record here, I think I have to ask you to tell the story of the Standard Oil project that you worked on, which involved some development project in Africa, and. Oh. The the, the 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 reluctance to allow you as a woman to come to the higher floor to meet with the the treasurer because this is a story that I have retold many times but I think I have to get your version of it on on tape as it were here. Okay, okay. Uh, one day uh, on a Friday uh, morning, uh, I got a call. Uh, the head of the department, uh, Ned Bennett, uh, said that uh, Standard Oil was thinking uh, was planning to build a refinery in South Africa. And um, and they had a certain uh, sum, you know, and this was Friday morning and the decision had to be made by Wednesday. And the question is, this is when there was the the uh, dollar shortage, you know, that whole I influence. And the question was, five years from now, will we be able to get our dollars out of there? In other words, uh, they paid uh, it, it, within South Africa, but the dollars didn't get back to Standard Oil in, in the United States. And so that, that's the question that came and it had to be answered. You know, I had to have an answer by Monday and then the, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, report was then to be reviewed. So I worked 20 hours a day uh, and then and I, I, but I used data and that was relatively new as Sandra. I got all the examples of other things that were, were gotten and, and looked for the evidence of where dollar shortages were eased and, and so on, and made, made a conclusion that the answer was yes, they would be able to get their dollars out by then. And so I had the report by the end of Monday and then my immediate boss, uh, looked at it, and then the head of the department looked at it, and it went to, um, what's his name, um, 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 Emilio Cagliato, who had been uh, the uh, head of the uh, IMF, you know, before he came there, uh, and so on, and it was the chief financial officer of Standard Oil of New Jersey, you know, he was like the person, and, and so on. And uh, so the next day, on Tuesday, uh, it was to be discussed with him. And my immediate boss said to me, 
when I came in at nine o'clock in the morning, I'm sorry, Anita, that uh, he won't have a woman in his office except his secretary. So I'm going down. And uh, so stay next to your phone. And all morning, every 10 minutes, the phone would ring. I would answer the question, phone would ring. And I, I, I began to really feel angry. And, but the interesting thing is that I was angry that I had done all the work and he was the one transmitting it, that, that was idiotic. I was less focused on, because it was a female, that it, it, it was the idiocy of, of it. So at lunchtime, when he came back and it was still to continue, I said, I just want you to know that of course I'm going to see this through appropriately, but I will never do this again. <laughs> and you can decide to fire me or you can decide to see that I never do a job for him again. But the one thing I will never do is this again. So uh, then he and the head of the department decided they would both take me down in the afternoon, unannounced in advance. We walked in the office and he said, who is she? And they answered, and he started by asking them the answer, but very within five minutes, I was answering. And that was the end of the problem. From then on, he was, it was not a problem. But I, I made 100%. I really felt the notion that I had worked, and I particularly, I think, because I'd worked 20 hours a day, <laughs> you know, and, and doing all this, and, and the idiocy. Of, of that arrangement was so offensive, but that was the end of the problem. He was courteous and, oh, you'll enjoy this story. 10 years later, when Kenneth was at Harvard, uh, Cagliato was invited to be a big speaker there and there was a dinner and Kenneth was there and they sat next to each other at a at, at dinner and Cagliato said, uh, how's your sister? Uh, Sandra Oll has never been the same without her. And Kenneth decided, should he bring up the subject or not? But if you knew Kenneth, you'd know he didn't. <laughs> That's great. But that was the funniest part of the whole thing uh, and so on. But it was a lesson for him. That was an example. He, he learned it by example. Well, I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a remarkable story. And it, of course, it reflects amazingly on you for, you know, for putting your foot down and saying, we're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve well, it. Now. I, and I really felt I could, it was too demeaning. It was, and that, but less, mostly because I had done all the work. You see, I was focused on that. Uh, obviously, being female was part of it, but I was insulted that I had done the work and he didn't want to hear me. Uh, and so on. Uh, anyway, that okay. was. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad that even though that was an NDER story, we managed to get that as part of the of the <laughs> narrative here. So, uh, <laughs> so, so Anita, uh, when did you actually leave the NBR? So, when you were a graduate student at Columbia, did you uh, I, I, some I, hours? I left NBER in 1947. And, and I don't remember what it was, but I left so it in 1947. So there was that's no when I started at Standard Oil. You started at Standard Oil in 47. And then I started Columbia after that. And you started Columbia after that. But when you were a graduate student at Columbia, did you ever meander down to Columbus Circle and put in no. some hours? No, no, not no. at all. No, I, I was through it. But it, 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 the, again, I'm using the phrase, the blood fit, the, the, the fastidiousness of the organization was something I admired so. The, 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 the absolute emphasis on accuracy, you know, of everything you're doing, uh, and, and, and the ethos of that, it was not just the work I was doing, the ethos of the place really got to me. That's a wonderful point. Uh, and, and I felt it, it just fit. It fit. Well, I've always been meticulous <laughs> about whatever I decide in personality. That's so, you know, I am. And, but the, that quality gave me a lifetime lesson. 
yeah. that, the, that the whole organization had that emphasis on pers- integrity and this I don't in this day and age I don't see much integrity where I in the world I live in <laughs> I don't mean you <laughs> no but yeah. it, it, you were also uh it seems working at with the very high level group I mean to yes or to Mitchell and to Burns not yes. to see some of the others, not to have a memory, for example, of Anna, who was probably there. But yes. you were you were in some sense um, treated as a very special RA research assistant. That's what I was an RA. And, yeah. and yeah. Burns, okay, uh, trusted to yeah. go down to the Forty Second Street Library with your large green pads of paper. And copy numbers. Yes. And oh, yeah. And I still remember and... those cards being wheeled out because other people in the library would look at me like I was crazy. <laughs> they were sitting and reading a book, and out would come a cart <laughs> with <laughs> a million things on it. Uh, right. And so on. Uh, and Spe- so on. Speaking of, of cards, do you, do you remember at all when you were entering numbers at the bureau whether they used uh, those IBM computing cards that would have been used in the late fi- in the late forties to uh, to enter numbers, or you you were putting them into a a, a, a calculator. I was putting them in a, to a calculator. I didn't work with okay. the cards. Whether they would then do the cards, I don't remember. But I I worked on the calculator. Yeah, and I worked on the calculator. And then I'm true. the one who brought regressions to Standard Oil, you know, as for analyzing <laughs> things uh, and so on. Well, I, I, elsewhere it may have been, but in that department, they, they weren't doing that yet. They were just chatting <laughs> and so on. So there we are. <laughs> no, this, this is absolutely fantastic. I mean, the... Hearing, hearing Anita, that you know, I've read a lot about the history of the organization, but the testimony that you've just provided on the ethos and the attention to the detail is it's remarkable, and it just comes through so much more vividly from your description of what it was like to work there. I am so so glad that you agreed to to do this for this because this is just wonderful. Uh, well, and it was it it was absolutely in the air there accuracy and precision and meticulous in that thing that was I, I i as i said i always had a tendency in that direction and in a sense this verified it that's yeah. it verified the worth of it that's the way i would put it. it's been a real pleasure uh to see you both and and well, it's and, great and, to see you and to think about the past yeah. and the fond so memories I, of seeing you at the university of pennsylvania it was, you remember it was that too. A, an absolutely great place. I often said to people, I don't want to leave Penn, but I want to go to Harvard. How can I do both? Of course, you can't do both. But you right. did what well, you wanted to do successfully. 